The air is filled with the sound of South African music. This is Splashy Fen, a sort of Woodstock, South African style. Each year, thousands of people from across the country flock to this farm near the Drakensberg Mountains. They come to listen to and to celebrate South African music. It wasn't very long ago that an event like this in this country would have provoked a strong police presence. The apartheid state would have been concerned about the liberal ideas that might be encouraged here. Certainly, the mixing of races and illegal activity at the time would have disturbed them greatly. Some of the policemen might have flipped open their notepads and begun writing down the lyrics of songs being performed. If the words seemed to be anti-government, they might have stopped the music. But this is post-apartheid South Africa, and today is a celebration of a struggle won. Hey, today's Freedom Day. Happy Freedom Day. Happy Freedom Week, Happy Freedom Year, and Happy Freedom Life. Thank you. Running blind headlong into the eye of the night. Freedom Day is one of the new South Africa's most important national holidays. April the 27th is the date of the country's first democratic elections which led to Nelson Mandela becoming president. Today, the stage features Roger Lucy, now better known as a television newsreader and reporter. Two decades ago, he was an up-and-coming musician. For the mostly young audience today, the bizarre and scary world of apartheid South Africa is something historical. But Roger Lucy lived in that world. The story is fascinating and frightening. It's one of censorship and sabotage, but its essence is simple. This is a story about stopping the music. Roger Lucy grew up in Durban, in an apolitical home in the late 1950s and 60s. His father was creative and eccentric, but a violent man. Roger's mother was conservative but charitable. Both of his parents worked, and this allowed the young Roger plenty of opportunity to do his own thing. He spent a lot of time with a Zulu friend, Jabula Makatini. He showed me around the back streets of Durban and the townships of, of Durban, particularly Kwamashu, from a very early age. Well, from my early teens, from the age of about 13, I think. Um, and it was, it was a wonderful time because it was, um, you know, home was, was a hostile and unpleasant place. School was a terrible place. I had learning disabilities and um, as a result, I never even finished school. But. Um, I had a, another life that was going on, it was a secret life. Roger and Jabula experienced Durban's alternative life together. This gave Roger a different view of the country, one that he could compare with the government propaganda of the time. Everywhere you turned, you were told that there was this onslaught, that, that the communists via South African blacks were going to take over this country, they were going to rape your sisters, they were going to, you know, come and live in your house and use the floorboards for firewood and, you know, just like the Russian Revolution and, um, and that we needed to be alert and we needed to, to, to be ready to fight this, this terrible scourge. But of course, you know, anybody that had been to any township in this country would be absolutely aware that that was absolute rubbish. At the same time, Roger began to get tuned into early white South African protest music. He was moved by what he was hearing and seeing, and he began to play the guitar. At first, he sang other people's songs, but soon he was writing his own. He basked on street corners and progressed onto the Durban folk scene. 
I'd been playing in Durban, at, you know, around the folk clubs and around. Um, I'd done some gigs down at those beachfront hotels with my cousin, but they were really rough and they were really awful. And I was starting to write songs, and I needed to, to, to find a way to, to, you know, get them out. And in Durban, I mean, you, I mean, whenever I try to play my own songs and at the at those beachfront hotels where I used to do gigs, I mean, you'd be threatened with violence. You know, it was really quite awful. Paul Erasmus grew up in Johannesburg, in average, middle-class circumstances. His father was Afrikaans and conservative. He had fought in the Second World War and suffered from post-traumatic stress. Paul was scared of him. Conversely, Paul's mother was English and came from a liberal family. My mother was, um, Shaim, I think, um, the original hippie. She was. Uh, liberal, she loved our uh, music, um, she loved Woodstock, um, she encouraged us to sort of expand our line of thinking. Um, she was very sad when I joined the police force and a week before she died, in fact the first week I started in the security branch, I actually promised her the last time I spoke to her that I would leave. I never carried out that promise and um, I regret it to this day. Although Paul was a rebellious teenager, he joined the South African police when he left school. He did this to avoid 18 months of military because he didn't want to be parted from his girlfriend for so long. Five months later, he graduated from the police training college in Pretoria and was transferred to the uniformed branch in Johannesburg. It was June 1976 where um, I was about 18, 19 years old. Went to work on a Wednesday morning and the writing had started in Soweto. And by that afternoon, they'd given us our rifles, as much ammunition as we could carry, loaded us into trucks, and we went into Soweto. And I think at that point, my life changed, like for many people. Um, across the board in South Africa, our lives all changed. But I certainly never realized that violence and destruction and that existed on a scale that I'd seen at that time had a terrible effect on me. Um, just seeing the bodies and the kids and the smell of burnt flesh, um, it was unbelievable. We all believed, as most South Africans did, that, um, that communism was behind us. We didn't look further than that. I mean, it, this was communism. Um, black nationalism had, had arrived in South Africa and we had to deal with it. I could have left the police force after the riot and I didn't. Modern day Johannesburg. It's a city struggling against a seemingly inevitable slide into violent crime and squalor. The upmarket clubs have moved to the shopping malls and suburbs. Venues such as the Chelsea, once symbols of a thriving music scene, are now derelict monuments to a past lost in urban decay. Roger has returned to Johannesburg to record a new album. It has been almost two decades since he left the city with his music career in tatters. This is part of Roger's gradual attempt to return to a life of music. In 1976, Roger moved to a Johannesburg very different from today. There was a flourishing folk scene based in clubs and outdoor music festivals. These venues offered Roger more receptive audiences than those in Durban. For the aspirant and confident musician, Johannesburg offered the right context to launch a successful music career. Roger arrived towards the tail end of the glamour years of central Johannesburg. Nightlife was alive as audiences flocked to see original music. Once I'd done those first few gigs, I started getting a momentum. You know, it, it started happening really quite, quite quickly, and, and, and um, yeah, it was, it was very good. I mean. He continued to write and perform protest songs, often influenced by stories he read in the Rand Daily Mail, a popular liberal daily newspaper at the time. Songs like "You Only Need Say Nothing." painted a landscape of political injustices under the apartheid regime.
they gunned down by cops They say that there's too many mourners And this is where it stops And they bring on the boots and the battens And the blood runs fear and cold And the moral of the exercise Is to do what you are told And you know that it's so I, I never considered um, a softer option for the songwriting because you know, that's what the folk musicians had done. They, well, they claimed to have done. They claimed that, you know, songs that were about the woodcutter felling the tree were, in fact, you know, m meant, you know, that the, you know, the, the axe was the arm of the law and the tree were the people. And that was just rubbish, you know, to me. Because, you know, um, you see, because I'd seen what was happening in black townships, I just felt that it was time to, you know, you, you, one couldn't hide behind the, those sort of symbolic lyrics. They were pointless. You needed to say what was going on. By 1978, Roger's music was beginning to receive critical acclaim. Much attention was focused on his cutting lyrics, so different to the majority of politically conservative music of the time. Audiences and media popularity eventually led to a residency at Mangles, a small folk club in central Johannesburg. At one of his performances, Roger was approached by a journalist of Voice of America. Over 20 years later, Roger returned to the site to tell the story. It was right here that um, the correspondent, whose name I've forgotten, from Voice of America, came and did his little interview, you know, here amongst the potatoes and the onions and the, you know, the plates and cups and saucers. And, um, it, yeah, it was, uh, it was, you know, that, I suppose that in a, in a funny way was like, it was to be a turning point of, you know, of things to come. As time would tell, this short interview would lead to dire consequences. In early 1979, independent label Third Ear Music recorded Roger's first album, The Road Is Much Longer. It included some of the politically powerful songs for which he'd become notorious. Only a few independent record shops stocked the album. It was also submitted to the government-controlled South African Broadcasting Corporation, who refused to play it for political reasons. The SABC's complete monopoly of the local airwaves meant that most South Africans would not hear the music. In January 1977, Paul Erasmus was transferred to the security branch at John Forster Square. He was 20 years old. He would spend the next 16 years performing covert acts on behalf of the nationalist government. The security branch occupied three floors of this building, the ground floor, the ninth floor, and the tenth floor. Um, and a lot of things happened here. The postal interceptions happened here, telephone interceptions, um, detainees, people that were arrested um, and held under the then security legislation were interrogated here. I think this place actually became a symbol more than, than any other establishment in the country of, of the oppression of the old regime. In the early years of his time at John Forster Square, Paul received a new directive from head office. It concerned a young musician named Roger Lucy, Voice of America, had broadcast Roger's Mangles interview and live performance. The authorities heard the program and Paul was put on the case. All superiors were furious about Roger's political lyrics, especially the song Lungile Tabalaza. The story about Lungile Tabalaza was a very, very simple one, and that's why it was so, it felt so important that it should become a song, because Lungile Tabalaza wasn't a well-known political person. He was just a guy, he was just a kid on the street who basically got picked up on suspicion of, of robbery. And, um, and in no time at all was murdered by the police. Well, the cops came Monday morning and they took them on suspicion of a robbery and arson. The law makes no provision, so they handed him to play clothes. A special grant to lead. And it doesn't really matter how strong you are, they've got ways to make you speak. They're gonna make you speak if they really wanna hear you speaking. They're gonna get it out of you, they're gonna hear your voice. Thank you. 
it would have been one thing to have written, you know, a song about a powerful political figure being murdered, but but it just seemed so much more powerful to to tell the story of a of a small man, you know, a little guy. Well, there was with Longila Tabalazi, there was no illusions about anything that was seen at the time, and I agreed with it as a direct attack on not only on the state but on the security branch. Roger was effectively saying that Longila Tabalaza was murdered. And, um, and it, was, it was very simple. I mean, the guy was picked up, he went down to the central police station, they questioned him, I don't think he gave the answers that he wanted to, so they threw him out the window. I don't believe that he was thrown, but probably in desperation, yeah, he, he jumped. Um, I've been in those offices as well. And at the time that I went through there was long after Roger had released the song. It was very much in my mind to actually be at the spot where Longile Tabalazi fell. Um, I must tell you, I don't like listening to the song. In fact, I never play it when I play Roger's music. It's just too direct and too hurtful. Especially the thing about the words, the, secure, the special branch elite. And it doesn't matter how strong you are, they've got ways to, to make you speak. Paul set about stopping Roger's music. He still has his case books from the time, and Roger's name appears often. Paul monitored press reports. He attended, recorded, and transcribed Roger's concerts. He and other security branch policemen also harassed Roger at his home in Langlachter Deep, the defunct mining town of Crown Mines. Today the village lies mostly in ruins. This was an amazing place, this, this Crown Mines. It was a whole bunch of like-minded people that lived here. Um, politicos and artists and uh, all sorts of people. I mean, just you know, people that kind of just worked in the city, but, you know, that felt an affinity to, to each other. And, um, and, and that's when I moved here. For a long period, our intentions were to break up the community because there was a lot of um, anti-government activity as we saw it, or as the authorities saw it, taking place there. And a lot of harassment um, happened in this whole area. We would drive through at night and shoot the cars up, um, take the windows out, toss the out petrol bomb. Well, this used to be my bedroom, and, and that was my little girl's room right next door. And um, it was right through that window one night that about 15 armed policemen suddenly appeared and turned the whole place upside down and asked a whole lot of stupid questions. And, and that was the kind of thing that happened quite a lot. Normally, for a psychological advantage, it was to wait until people were sleeping or rested. The least, the least expected time for something like that to happen. Roger was still playing at Mangles when Paul escalated his attempts to stop his music. In 1979, Mangles was Roger's favorite place to play. Today, it's a popular takeaway restaurant. It was supposed to be just another night at Mangles for Roger, but for Paul, it was the night he and his security branch colleagues decided to change tactics from harassment to sabotage. Storms and fires have come, but can a pain and doubt? I mean, the whole place was much, much darker for one thing. It was, you know, gloomy and there were candles on the tables. This was where the stage was. And it was a tiny little stage, but it was fairly high. So if you stood up, you had to kind of watch that you didn't bump your nut. Or tall guitar players had to kind of like sort of sit down. We'd invariably end up at four o'clock in the police pub. We'd have quite a lot to drink. And of course, that provided a lot of uh, so-called Dutch courage as well. You could gauge your performance, you know, as you were going along, you could see people you know, becoming connected to you, or if, you, if you're losing them, you know, you could feel them coming on the journey with you. It was the sort of hidden side of, of the security branch was these, as I referred to them, nocturnal activities, you know, throwing bricks through windows, burning out cars, um, shotgunning people's homes, um, putting tear gas in, in air conditioners. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, you couldn't squeeze into this place. You know, Friday nights, Saturday nights were absolutely packed. Well, that particular night, I would have driven out to 
I don't remember the times. Um, my instructions been given to me earlier that day to um, trash Roger, stop this filth. Um, uh, the stairs behind us, you know, would be, you could just, I mean, it was, it was really difficult to get to the stage. You know, people would like pass my guitar, you know, from one person to the next and I could squeeze through. It was, it was really, really awesome. And I do remember parking somewhere in the alleyway and uh, the Soweto guys had the tear gas crystals and we made a joint decision as the first sort of part of trashing Roger was to chuck it, disrupt the show by chucking it into the air conditioner. Um, with the sort of oppressive nature of, of society, I think that whole folk music clique was, an, was a, a kind of a home for, for I suppose, so-called, you know, lefties at the time. This is amazing. After all these years, it's been, what, 20, 22 years, 23 years? I remember Mangles now, although it was very different to Curry Den. We were parked in this alleyway here. I suppose like, like any other night, you know, the place was packed and, um, uh, as I remember, I don't think I was playing at the time. I, don't, I think I was just, you know, sort of hanging around in the back here or, you know, with somebody. This would have been, certainly been the place where you put it in here. This goes straight down, as I re recollect or can recall, straight down into the, the hall or the area where Roger was singing. The place was completely full, and and slowly, you know, people sort of became aware of this, you know, irritant in the air, and um, and suddenly there was this kind of accelerated sort of panic, and everyone went racing up the stairs and and out of here. Our biggest thing was most of, most of these things, and like this one was, you know, in the grand scheme of things, pretty low key was to avoid being caught at all costs. But I also seem to remember that it's you know after. A, a while, we, we kind of, the air cleared and we came back in. Our favorite hanging out place was the Devonshire Hotel, um, which had this, this club or this bar where a lot of the students used to hang out and play pool and drink and they'd have um, sometimes live bands or recorded music. And we'd sort of invariably end up here and, at the same time we'd enjoy ourselves, you'd always pick up snippets of information that were security relevant. Paul's activities did not stop with the tear gassing of Mangles. He waged a strategic campaign to shut down Roger's career. Roger's telephone was monitored, as were other people um, in the industry that, or in the, the segment that, that he was part of. So we, we knew after that there were shows coming up or he'd been booked or um, he was going to appear at, at whatever place. And it was a simple matter then of, of using this incident um, as a sort of threatening stick with the next venue. If you let that bastard Lucy, that terrorist Lucy, play again, we're going to blow the place up. Soon after the tear gas event, Roger went overseas for a few months. When he returned, he found that Paul's threats to venue owners had taken effect. He formed the highly acclaimed Zub Zub Marauders and set about securing live gigs. I mean, one particular case is where, where we were. We were contracted. We were, we, when we had, a, we had a, a written contract to go and to do a, 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 a big, you know, an open air festival, and um, you know, as I say, we were about to appear, we were about to walk onto the stage, and we got told, "Hey, you know, you guys are not on anymore," which was weird because we were really popular. The band was popular, and it was good. It was a really, really good band, and you know, we showed them this contract and said, "Hey, here's, here's the contract." I mean, uh, so sorry, no, that's just it's not on. It's just you're not playing. That's it. In late 1980, Roger recorded his second album. Half Alive. Once again he recorded with Third Ear Music. But this time, a distribution deal was struck with a major company, Weir Records. The deal came at a cost. 
Roger was pressured to soften his political stance. And I think it was an effort to, to compromise and to maybe allay the fears of the record company, you know, to put songs out that weren't really that, um, you know, that critical of, of the state. Compromise extended to releasing a song with an accompanying music video for purely commercial reasons. I mean, we, we put that song out thinking that, you know, it would, would be radio friendly, and it just ended up being absolutely awful. And the video was, it was also awful, I think. I mean, I, I, some, some people don't think so, but, you know, I just think it's absolutely embarrassing. And every time I see it, it's like a big lesson, you know, don't ever write a song to go and try and make money. Despite the compromise, the broadcasters avoided Roger's music. In 1981, a student documentary crew interviewed a frustrated and disillusioned Lucy. They're just the bands playing around Joburg, who've all you know, done really good singles or good albums that are, you know, are worthy of being played. They're not on. You know, they're not on at all. Paul again escalated his campaign. He seized Roger's records from shops. Copies of the two albums were submitted to the Directorate of Publications for banning. It became illegal to own The Road Is Much Longer. Paul warned record company reps not to touch Roger's music in the future. With almost all outlets closed to him, Roger's career was all but over. Paul's commitment to the state went far beyond his operations against Roger. In 1982, he went to war on the Namibian border. Paul was part of a special police intelligence group. The unit interrogated and sometimes killed suspected enemies and informers. Throughout the 80s, Paul followed a wide range of orders from his superiors. He helped plan the bombing of Khotso House, an office building where several anti-apartheid groups were based. He even played a role in the bombing of the church in which he was christened. But by the early 90s, Paul had had enough. But simply, I just couldn't, over the last four years up until from 1988, 89, I just couldn't take the filth, the deception, the lying, the threats. By 1982, Roger was unable to make a living from his music. For a while, he worked as a doorman at the Chelsea. He then became a barman at Lachaim in Hillbrow, sometimes playing at the end of his shift. Today, the bar is called a Golden Banana, and Roger has been persuaded to give an impromptu performance. It was extremely it's hard, but there was a certain comfort in, in, in being here in a place that I'd, you know, I, I knew the people. I was, and I became like the barman that was, you know, the, you know, everyone's favourite barman. You know, people would come and uh, unload their bad day on me, and, and, and it was cool. It was a, it was a, it was a very growthful time for me. At the same time as, you know, I, it, I grew from a, from an extremely low point, you know, to something where I went out and carried on building my life again. And as you pick yourself up again off the floor, they come in again, they're gonna cut you From down. here, I, 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 I got a job at ProSound and started doing like this apprenticeship in, in sound engineering. And then f you know, that led me into, into the film industry, which led me into the news business. Roger entered the news industry in the midst of ongoing political turmoil. He began to experience firsthand the strife reflected in his songs. Despite a change in his career, Roger didn't immediately give up music. He played when he could, but he was never able to secure anything financially viable. An association with the independent Shifty Records led to the inclusion of two new songs on separate compilation albums. 
forces favourites, and a Nachi in our society. During this time, Roger undertook a new musical venture. He formed a country band called Tighthead Faree and the Loose Forwards. Tell me that you love me still Well, I heard those words before But it was also an opportunity for us to, to create a little band that, you know, as a, as a nom de plume, you know, as a nom de guerre maybe, you know, but um, as we sang a lot of quite radical country songs in Tight Head, but we'd dress up, you know, and I always wore my shirt with ANC colours, you know, the, you know, the, you know sort of cowboy tassels, but in ANC colours. And um, it was where songs like No Easy Walk to Freedom first popped up. And it, you know, it was in the, um, it was in a, in a very, very tough time of this country's history. A man's cry. It was an attempt to, to refloat a, a bit of us, you know, being, for me to play again. Um, but I, you know, needed to do it in another guise. But by that point, I'd already, uh, it was all over, you know, so it wasn't long before I got my job at WTN and moved on. Roger's job as a newsperson took him to war-torn places around the world. He covered the wars in Bosnia and Grozny, but his heart was never really in the job. I fell into news by accident. I mean, I, I was never designed to be a newsperson. I was a, I was a musician, I was a songwriter, but I needed a job, and I, and I showed a certain um, talent for it. So I was able to do the job, you know, fairly efficiently. And um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of job where, you know, death was, was, was very, very common. You know, filming people dying was what we did. The stress took its toll on Roger. He resigned from news work and took up a career in acting. Towards the end of the year of working as an actor, Roger turned to the mountains of the Western Cape for comfort. Today, it's the place he goes when he needs to get away from the pressures of the city. I came out into this valley and bought a piece of land and, um, and started building a little house, which um, was something that I needed to do. It was in order to go through some sort of healing process, and I did it, and um, it worked. It was at this time that Paul Erasmus published his revelations in the Mail and Guardian newspaper. I'd been secretly, not for any other reason apart from it, was part of my therapy, or a cathartic process, been putting things down on paper, and written this manuscript. And the advice and the, the avenue that I've decided to go down was um, to get somebody um, in the media world, in a respectable public or reputable publication, and, and let the story come out. I just didn't realize what a floodgate I was actually opening at the time. I was in Grahamstown doing a show, and um, I met up with my old friend James Phillips in the bar after quite, you know, after we'd done, done I remember he was quite, he was quite pissed, and um, I had every intention of joining him on that plateau. And as I walked in, he said, Hey, Roger, he had this sort of laconic voice, you know, Roger, you didn't need those O's to stuff up your music career, he said. He said, you were doing a great job yourself. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about, James? And he showed me this, this clip from, this, um, from the Mail and Guardian about Paul Erasmus. Paul has become a big Roger Lucy fan. He still has a record he confiscated all those years ago, and he plays it often. Um. I thought people like him were dangerous, I believed it. You know, where I was uh, later sub subsequently said I secretly became a fan of his, was transcribing his music, sitting for hours, especially after that first Voice of America um, tape. The quality was very bad. I sat for many, many hours listening with the rewind button over and over and over, and eventually the music sort of started to get to me, so I enjoyed it. And then later on when I um, confiscated the, the batch of records and tapes. I used to play it regularly. Um, especially, I think, in sort of depressing moments, you know. What was happening in the country wasn't lost on, on all of us. I mean, we weren't totally immune to it. 
and it was a very, very important. It started a very important process in my life, a process of 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 rebuilding my life and and eventually reinventing myself and you know getting myself back together again and um, and happy. In the late nineties, Roger went back into the news business. He shoots, produces, and reports news about the arts in South Africa. And writing and performing music are once again an important part of his life. After his initial revelations, Paul continued to go public with his stories about the security branch. He played a prominent role in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings, and he applied for amnesty for his security police activities. I was a member of the security branch of the South African police from 1977 until May 1993. Within the parameters of STATCOM, Methods ranging from so-called, uh, from excuse me, dirty tricks or so-called dirty tricks to sabotage were used, utilized freely. On all but minor cases, amnesty was granted. He has now started his own business, based at his home in George. These two men, who had such a profound impact on each other's lives, had never met in person. In a spirit of reconciliation they agreed to meet for the first time. The site of the meeting was the Devonshire Hotel, the place where Paul used to hang out and where he celebrated the successful tear gassing of Mangles. I actually suddenly just became quite nervous. I, I've, I've really been, I mean, up to now, for the last several days, knowing that this is imminent, I've been feeling absolutely fine. But just driving here, just as I came into Bromptine, I suddenly had a, like a flood of memories and um, a kind of a nervousness and and yeah the the past came it's just very strange i mean it feels very strange my hands all sweaty i'm actually a bit nervous i must must confess because i've spoken to roger a couple of years ago on the phone but uh, i think to meet him in person it's for me it's going to be a actually a great honor and i think uh, an opportunity to Swap some ideas about what happened to him and what's happened to all of us. This is very personal. This is, and um, you know, I'm, a lot of my friends have been saying to me, "God, you've got to go and punch him." And you know, what a dickhead. And you know, and I just don't see it like that. I mean, I just think that the guys, he's probably had a harder time than I've had. It's actually, an, an irony. I mean, it's it's amazing that all these years on, you know, different times, new country, new direction. I think for many of us that um, yeah, we can get together and talk about things like this. I suppose to, to a large extent I've disassociated myself with that time, let it go by and you know, and I suppose this is, it's, it's forcing it back on me and um, I suddenly wondered why I'm doing it, you know, if I really want to do this, but yeah, here it is, again, face, face up to the past, you know. How's it going? <laughs> so weird. Yeah, this is a, well, we've organized your beer there. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Well, I've had a lot of conflict with my friends and, and, you know, really people that are close to me because, you know, to be honest with you, I don't, I think that you um, were as much a victim as anybody else in, in uh, many ways. I and people think that I'm, you know, you know and, and I've had a lot of, I've had to deal with a lot of criticism from people because of that. You know, mates of mine say, when you go in there, you've got a deck, though, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's... We were joking about it earlier, on, you know, how's it, Roger? <laughs> how's it, Paul? Like, yeah, like, yeah, you know? yeah, no, it's... Yeah, it's funny, eh, Paul? It's, um, it's you know, sad. And, uh, I mean, for me, it's, you know, it's... And, and everything that happened there, you know, led to me having what has become a, you know, quite a hard, yeah. but a really fascinating life, you know? Yeah, no, it's been an interesting time, you know, and yeah. I've, been, have, I've been forced to kind of, you know, reinvent myself and get on with it you know so it's it's been it's been quite quite something but I must say that when I first read that that excerpt from your book in the Mail and Guardian mm. 94 or 5 there was a great sense of relief you know at, at knowing that all that stuff that was happening at the time you know there was it was at the time it you know it, it was like faceless you know I didn't know that it was yeah. and nobody so owned up to it nobody admitted that they were getting leaned on and you know so it was but that was hard, you know. That was the hardest part. But anyway, you know, it's it's over. I'm 
You just double set to reinvent myself. I mean. And and have you found peace with yourself these days? Are you still? I don't think you ever will. You know, um, I've I've still got my case books, for example. There's eleven thousand cases that I investigated in my tenure in the security branch. You know, each one of those was an abuse of human rights or somebody's um, value system. Mm -hmm. Or their rights as, as citizens in a country or even guests in a country, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and then the people that were injured, I mean, it's, it weighs heavily on one's conscience. You can never get away from it. You know, I can rem I remember, I mean, I rem when I first saw your photograph, mm. I saw, I rem recognized you from Mangles. You used to come mm. and you and other oaks. I couldn't even remember how many times I was there. I remember the one night you were on stage. I must have been also been a bit out of it. You had a, a white clock robe on. Yeah. Your hair was very long. Yeah. Um, that's one of the. the, the but you were also quite aggressive. I mean, there was once a time when somebody came in with a camera and they just sat and clicked away on the back. I don't know who that yeah. was. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, what, what was it like? I mean, was I a pain in the ass at that point? Well, I tell you, the words of um, Longili Tabalaza were just the end. Is it? That, that, was, that song alone was the... That was the one that... Uh, Longili Tabalaza, this direct sort of thing about um, Tabalaza's death was, was too much. Mm. And Stuttler's words to me, stop this filth. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, so it worked. I mean, because I mean, for yeah. me, you know, it was, oh, it was so strange. I mean, we'd have these gigs, you know, organized and booked and we get there and the guy would say, no, 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 you're not playing tonight. Mm -hmm. And I say, what? what are you talking well, about? Well, I remember no, clearly no, telling everybody that, that we were on the verge of arresting you for terrorism. Yeah. You know, by implication, you were yeah. a terrorist and therefore yeah. a dangerous man. Um, to hell with the music, you would have pitched up there with <laughs> the <like> K-47s <laughs> in your little mafia style. <laughs> were you actually checking my mail? Look, it, it was routine. If you had a telephone, it was tapped. Um, the post would have been intercepted, in-going and out-going. Um, I don't know about tomatoes. No, tomato was out term for a bug ever being put in Peacock Cottage or other places. I was shocked, actually quite perturbed yesterday to hear that this thing had damaged you to the point that you ended up as a dormant mm. at the Chelsea, which was also one of my hanging yeah. places. I mean, we used to go there socially. Um, you know, that, that rocked me, but I knew that I damaged your career. I don't know about your, your, what music was released subsequent to that. I sort of, it's just what I heard in Yeah, no, nothing happened for, for, for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was strange. I mean, because, you know, it really, I mean, doors just closed, you know. But where I am now at this point in time is wonderful. And I've had been forced to, to kind of pick myself up, you know, and, um, and get on with it. And it's been, it's been very good, you know. Well, I can tell you, and I, I'll say that from the heart, I was, I think, more relieved than anything when Dave Marks told me that your music's being re-released. It was like this, something just, <laughs> something lifted off, you know. Uh, still got a couple yeah. of tons to yeah. go, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it did me good to hear that, really did. Hey. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> a reconciliation of sorts had taken place. In keeping with the theme of the day, we organized the Lucy performance especially for Paul, a concert for one. For the first time, Paul Erasmus would watch Roger Lucy play his music, not as a policeman, but as a fan. The concert took place at the Market Theatre in Johannesburg, the site of some of Lucy's best performances. Riding high there you go Will I touch you or will I know Where you been or will you go And I'm still hanging And I want you to know That that highway is just like a prison And from where I'm standing There's no space that's near And the one thing only that's certain Is that the road is much longer than ever before that the road is much longer than ever before That the road is much longer than ever before yeah, 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 yeah. And the cars just shoot by you And the sun's in your eyes And you stand and you sweat 
And you swear at the flies and the big boys and big cars, they flash you big signs. It's the same old story, right up and down the line, and that highway is just like a prison. From where I'm standing, there's no space that's near, and the one thing, only that's certain, that the road is much longer than ever before. That the road is much longer than ever before. That the road is much longer than ever before. And a truck driver stops for a rap, for a ride. So you get in and you talk about work till the miles and the roar of the horses it gets in between. But the scars on his knuckles, they show you where he's been in that highway. It's just like a prison. From where I'm standing, there's no space that's near. The one thing only that's certain. That the road is much longer than ever before. That the road is much longer than ever before. That the road is much longer than ever before. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now the night's falling, and I'm nearer to home. I hear you calling. Feeling alone, well it's up and down highways always returning Cause somehow there just seems to be no escape from that highway And it's just like a prison From where I'm standing, there's no space that's near And the one thing only that's certain Is that the road is much longer than ever before That the road is much longer than ever before that the road is much longer, oh, much longer. And the road is so much longer, and the road is much longer, much longer, much longer, much longer. Oh, the road is much longer, and that road is much longer than ever before. Yeah, 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 Tremendous. It's amazing. He's an amazing guy. Um, I think his attitude is absolutely super. I don't know if, if the roles were reversed, if I would have been so conciliated, I must say. You know, I don't I really don't have any uh, grudge is a hard feeling. I can't find any anger in my heart for that man. And I think he's probably going through a, a far harder time in his life than, than I've been through recently. He's probably got the most awful demons to face up to now. But it was, um, it was very cathartic. I like run away. I like run away. I'm okay. Yes, I'm okay.